Again, my name is Leslie Clasing. I'm with the law firm of Waldrop, Stewart, and Kendrick in Birmingham. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here with y'all this afternoon to talk about timber trespass. Uh, before I even get to that, I wanted to read to y'all a few quotes that I came across when I was getting ready for this presentation, some of which show just the, the sheer lack of understanding that some people have when it comes to timber theft or timber trespass and how actually important it is. And some of these quotes that actually show that, that people really do understand what's going on. One that I believe is pretty on point was one that said, the majority of timber theft occurs under what has been deemed to be a, quote, culture of theft. This culture is the belief that taking trees here or there has no real harm but that rather it's necessary for a logger to make a living. In other words, it's just kind of a socially acceptable, uh, I use that phrase lightly, uh, thing that loggers may deem themselves entitled to do because it's just a few trees to you and it's really important for him to be able to make a living. And that obviously couldn't be any more wrong. Uh, another quote that I came across, what's the big deal about a few trees? Similar sentiment there. And then this was something that was supposedly said to a logger who was accused of timber theft. Don't worry, you know the owner won't spend the kind of money it takes to get a survey and a timber consultant. You'll be fine. But then the most telling statement that I came across is the reason why people continue to steal timber is because they can. Wow. And we'll talk a little bit about things that you can do to try to help uh, minimize that ability of people being able to and therefore some people just taking advantage of the opportunity. So first, what is trespass? Uh, basically, anytime you step foot onto another person's property, even for just a second, you are liable for trespass unless the property owner has given you his or her consent. You have to have intended to be moving, but you didn't have to intend to enter somebody else's property. In other words, if I'm just walking along and accidentally find myself on someone else's property that I didn't mean to, to get onto somebody else's property, I have trespassed his property. Now, if I was hit by a car and thrown through the air onto somebody else's property, then that intent is not there and I wouldn't be held liable for, for trespass. That's an example that they gave us in law school. I always thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> What is timber trespass? That's, of course, what y'all are much more interested in. Timber trespass is not only entering someone else's property, but also removing the timber from that person's property without consent or permission. You can be liable for timber trespass if you are cutting timber on a person's land with that person's permission, but you cut more timber than you receive the permission for. And that's frequently what you see. If you have contracted with a contractor to cut some of your timber, or perhaps your neighbor has a contract to have somebody cut some of his timber, and the contractor either intentionally or accidentally, and it might actually be an accident, or he might claim it to be an accident, but it was actually intentional, he you know, kind of encroaches beyond where he was supposed to be. That's that's a way that you see timber theft or timber trespass very frequently. We have timber trespass laws, of course, uh, trying to prevent that from happening and also to try to help make the owner whole if it does unfortunately happen. Uh, trees are obviously a significant value in many ways. They bring economic value, as y'all know, aesthetic value, emotional value, environmental value. Um, so again, the timber trespass laws, and each state has some, and we're going to talk about Alabama's in particular, uh, that have been enacted to help property owners protect the value of their trees by penalizing the wrongdoer when they cut, either intentionally or unintentionally, timber that they were not supposed to, and also provide compensation to the property owner whose timber was wrongfully cut. I don't know if y'all remember the book by Dr. Seuss from 1971-ish, 
called the Lorax. Uh, it's one that just kind of came to mind when I was getting ready for this. Uh, it warned that, of taking too much out of the environment, and in particular, it was talking about endangered trees without protecting them. And the Lorax, the quote that you have here, unless someone like you cares an awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. And just always love Dr. Seuss, so I thought I'd throw that in there. Now, for a timber trespass claim, if you have had somebody take your timber and you're going to try to uh, pursue them for timber trespass, there are certain things that you have to prove. You have to prove that you were the owner of the real property. You have to prove that they entered your property and removed the timber without your permission. And you have to prove what their mental culpability was, what their thought process was. And obviously proving what someone else is thinking is very difficult. You know, all you can really know what somebody is thinking is what you yourself is thinking. But the courts, at least in Alabama, have put that burden on you. But there are ways, and we're going to talk about some specific cases where it was held by the courts that the person did intend to wrongfully take the timber and therefore they were hit with higher penalties and damages because the owner was able to prove that they had a bad intent when they took the, the timber. Now, in Alabama, you can be penalized by either criminally or civilly if you are out there taking timber wrongfully. Criminally means that the, the wrongdoer actually can, can suffer uh, jail time or be subject to criminal penalties. Civil actions are where the, you, the property owner, may bring a lawsuit against the wrongdoer and seek to recover damages. First, we'll talk about the criminal penalties. It's a Class A misdemeanor in Alabama for anyone to willfully and knowingly, and that's a phrase that you're going to hear me say several times this afternoon, do any of these things. Willfully and knowingly cut, destroy, or otherwise damage timber or forest products that weren't his and without permission. Willfully and knowingly remove timber that was not his and without permission. Willfully and knowingly transport timber that has been severed in violation of one of those other two first two bullet points. Uh, willfully and knowingly purchase or contract purchase to obtain timber that was uh, acquired uh, in violation of the statute, or sell any of this timber. And the code section on this is Alabama Code 9-13-60. As I said, it's a Class A misdemeanor. What that means here is that the, the offender is found guilty. He could be sentenced to up to a year in prison. He could also be fined $6,000. Those fines, though, that are collected don't go to the property owner. They go to the Alabama Forestry Commission fund. So it doesn't really help make you whole, but it is a criminal penalty for him. But again, all of those require willful and knowing intent on the part of the actor. And we're going to talk about that again in just a few more minutes. You also have civil penalties. And this again is where you, if you figure out that someone has wrongfully taken some of your timber, bring a lawsuit against them. And if you prevail in the lawsuit, you can obtain damages, and that's what this is about, anyone. And on this particular one, you don't have to prove what the intent was. Anyone who damages, destroys, cuts, or removes timber or other forest products that is not his own without permission is liable to the owner for double the fair market value. So intent, again, doesn't matter whether he meant to or not. And what this is intended to do is not only make you whole, but not just penalize people who you know, have an intent to go out there and wrongfully steal somebody's timber, but also try to encourage people that are cutting timber to be more careful. Because by accidentally cutting some of your trees that they shouldn't have, that they didn't have the right to cut, they're going to have to pay double that amount back to you. So that's what that is for, and that's why the intention doesn't matter. You also can have some additional penalties, though, if the person 
did act in a willful and knowing manner. If a, a wrongful cutter willfully and knowingly cuts down any of these particular trees, cypress, pecan, oak, pine, cedar, poplar, walnut, hickory, or wild cherry, without permission and they were not his own, you have an extra penalty of $20 per tree. Extra. Extra. Uh, that is in addition to the double the fair market value that I just talked about. The double the fair market value comes whether they meant to or not. If they cut one of your trees and it's any of these particular kinds, then in addition to that double fair, mar the fair market value, they have to pay $20 per tree. You also have, if they willfully and knowingly cut any fruit tree or ornamental tree, or a shrub which has been enclosed on premises not his own, that's $15 per tree. And then if there are other kinds of trees that they have cut, damaged, killed, uh, again, willfully, knowingly, those trees would be $10 per tree. So that's where you can, you know, depending on the, the magnitude of the wrongful cut, you could be talking about a lot of money if you can prove that they willfully and knowingly did take that action. And again, that's in addition to the double, the fair market value that we talked about before. And by the way, you've got one year, just one year to chase down these particular damages after the cutting happens. So we're going to talk in a few minutes about how to try to avoid this altogether. One of the ways is to be very tuned in to your property. And one of the many reasons why you want to be very tuned in to what's going on in your property is that if 366 days go by and then you figure out that all your pecan trees have been taken down, it is too late to go after this extra $20 per tree penalty. Okay, willful and knowing, that's what you've heard me say over and over. That's really the standard that, that gives rise to extra penalties against these wrongdoers when they intentionally take these actions. The standard, because it is punitive in nature, it is subject to a real strict interpretation. In other words, the courts don't casually find that somebody willingly and knowing, willfully and knowingly took down trees. Um, it, the willful and knowing shows an intent to produce the result that actually happened. In other words, they, they set out to cut down the trees. That's what they did. That's what happened. That's, that is what gives rise to that willful and knowing. Uh, if somebody was negligent in doing it, then they were by definition not acting in a willful and knowing manner. You can't have it both ways if it, if it was actually an accident. And of course, they'll always claim that it was. That's, that's the easy out for them is that they didn't know. Uh, but if they can convince a court that it was negligence on their part, then they will win on this willful and knowing issue because the court won't be convinced that they were willfully and knowingly acting. But getting into whether something is believably willfully and knowingly acted upon by the bad actor is the real question for these cases. If the cutter had an unreasonable belief, or believed that he was supposed to be cutting where he was, but the court finds that that belief was unreasonable because he didn't take enough steps on his own to, he, he didn't act appropriately in taking down these trees because he was kind of on notice of something. And uh, I'll give you an example. This was an Alabama case from 1986 where a company, the Container Corporation, purchased some land. And when it bought the land, it bought it intending to take down the trees on the land that they bought. All that's legitimate. That's fine. They relied on the boundaries in the survey that they were given. But when they got out there and started taking down the trees, they started coming across a fence that was on this property. And it, it was kind of clearly marked that it was somebody else's. And 
they even looked at their survey and said, well, the survey says that this is ours, so we're going to take down these, all, all these trees. They, they took down all the trees. And what the Alabama Supreme Court found was that somebody else had actually acquired that property by adverse possession. And I'll talk with y'all about that in just a second. That's where you can acquire property without a deed, but by, by inhabiting the property kind of open and notoriously. I'll talk about that in just a second. But somebody else had acquired that particular portion of the property that the company bought. They had put up fences. They had made it clear that this is somebody else's property, and the court found that it was not reasonable for the company to go ahead and cut all those trees down because the, the existence of the fence should have put them on notice. There's another case. This is a Virginia case. So it's not uh, directly on point with Alabama, but I find it very interesting and I think that, that it's just a good example of somebody being found to be willful and knowing when he took down trees. This was, there was the contract was not written down between the, the contractor that was going to take down the trees and the property owner. It's just an oral contract. The owner at the time of the contract was apparently drunk and the contractor knew it. The owner was 82 years old, blind, and mentally feeble, and the contractor knew it. And the contractor was actually related to the owner of the property, referred to him as Cousin Allen. And he knew that Cousin Allen, again, was impaired and not of a sound mind at the time Cousin Allen said, yeah, you can go out and take some, down some of my trees for me. Well, the, he started cutting down some trees without any real information about where Cousin Allen's property ended and where somebody else's property started. So he, of course, went across that line and took down a bunch of somebody else's trees altogether. And he was even told as he was doing so, why are you doing this? This property belongs to somebody totally different. He said, oh, Cousin Allen, this is Cousin Allen's property. I get to, uh, Cousin Allen wants me to take down the trees. And somebody said, no. That's not Cousin Allen's trees, that's somebody else's. And of course, the somebody else was right, and the, the trees did not belong to Cousin Allen, but did in fact belong to somebody else. And in that case, uh, the contractor was found to have acted in a willful and knowing manner. And if that had it happened in Alabama, he would have been subject to the $20 per tree, as well as the double damages. We talked about, in order to bring these cases, you have to be the actual owner of the property. Um, and really the only place that, where that can come into to being, or where it can become an issue is on this issue of uh, adverse possession that, that I touched on just a minute ago. And so that's what I wanted to touch on again because it's just kind of important as it relates to y'all being on your property. You may not live there, and you may live far away from it, but you need to have a presence on the property anyway as much as you can, uh, because if somebody else were to uh, start inhabiting your property in an exclusive manner, actual and uninterrupted, open and notorious, and hostile and under a claim of right, in other words, they believe they have the right to be there, and if they did that for 10 years, here in Alabama, then they actually would become the owner of that portion of property. I don't want to go too far on that because I want to get to probably the most important part of what I'm going to talk about is y'all trying to prevent timber trespass from even occurring. We talked about the damages that you might be entitled to receive, but the better plan of action, obviously, is to avoid it from happening altogether. Be aware of your property boundaries and have them clearly marked. Uh, Loggers that are bad actors try to find hidden areas that may not be very noticeable by you. They will go looking for those because they think that you won't notice if they take down timber from those areas. So you want to be very tuned in to where your property is, have the boundaries marked, walk your property on a regular basis, be there. Uh, Talk to your neighbors. Uh, having kind of a neighborhood watch thing is a good idea. You watch out for them and have them watch out for you uh, so that y'all can uh, notify each other. 
if anything is happening that shouldn't be happening. Timber thieves are not likely, it's just like at your home, they're not likely, if you're at, at home and they see you in the front yard playing with your kids, your grandkids, they're not going to come and break into your house right there in front, of, in front of you. If they see you there, they're not going to come, so you just want to have a good presence on your property, and I'm just almost out of time, so I'm going to zip through this. Um, again, marking the boundaries of your property. Uh, I don't know if you can tell here, but what we have is trees that are marked. That helps uh, in a lot of ways. If you have a contract with a logger that's going to take down some of your trees, you can show him this is the boundary. And that helps two things. One, it hopefully helps him not cut where he's not supposed to, which is the ultimate goal. But two, if he does, it helps you prove your case that he did it intentionally. And also, an old saying about good fences make good neighbors. Fences are, are exceptionally helpful in marking boundary lines. It's like the, the case that I told you all about where a fence was there, the logger ignored it and went out, cut the trees down anyway, and he was held to that higher standard. Um, I know that I've kind of zipped through this last part, but the most important thing is just be aware of what's going on on your property. Uh, again, talk to your neighbors. If you're going to have some trees taken down, tell your neighbors so that they can keep an eye out for their property and ask them to make sure and do the same thing. If they're going to have some trees taken down, make sure that you've asked them to let you know. Because if that's happening, you want to be there. You want to not only be seeing what's going on, but you want those loggers to see you there. Because if they see you there, they're not going to be as likely to accidentally come and take your trees. I'm way out of time. I appreciate y'all's time this afternoon. And my email address is on the very last slide. And if you have a handout, you've got it. If anybody ever needs anything or if I can answer any questions about any of this, please feel free to reach out to me anytime. Thank y'all.